All right. Sorry for the technical difficulties. As welcome everybody to the Thursday, October 15th, 2020 meeting of the Humboldt County Planning Commission. Um, uh, as usual, you can go, to, if you have any questions on how to access the Planning Commission meeting, go to the county website under Planning Commission and we'll give you instructions for either joining us by computer or by phone. Um, and it'll it give you detailed instructions there. Uh, so with that, I will call this meeting to order and ask you to please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would please do roll call, Suzanne. And Commissioner Bunkio. Here. Commissioner Pellegrini. Here. Here. Uh, Commissioner Levy is late. Uh, Commissioner Newman. Here. Thank you. Commissioner O'Neill. Here. Commissioner Mitchell is absent. And Commissioner McCaver. Here. Okay, thank you. It appears we have a quorum. So um, at this time, I'd ask the director if we have any modifications or additions to the agenda. Yes, there, there are a couple. Uh, the first thing I'd like to point out is that there is a, uh, a memo for Matoll River Farms. This is item number uh, E8 that is requesting a continuance to November 5th. We do not have enough items to fill up the November 5th agenda, and so there won't be a meeting on November 5th. So we're going to ask for a continuance of item E8, Matoll River Farm, to November um, it's November, it's, sorry, 19th, thank you. And then item E1030, Dean Creek Road, uh, this is not a modification. There is a supplemental information for items number 10 and 11. Both include revised revol uh, resolutions and revised plans. For item number 12, there are two, uh, supplementals and one of those is requesting a continuance to a date uncertain. Uh, we received some information that uh, is warrant our doing some additional investigation to determine the veracity of the, the odor concerns and so we will do that before it comes back to the planning commission. And I'd just like to say that the uh, planning commission received a letter dated October 15, 2020 from Larry Henderson I have met with Mr. Henderson, and I think that we have an agreement on how to proceed forward. And so that has been resolved uh, for today. Excellent. Okay, with that, I am not, I don't have a video that's showing that. Maybe, are you showing me as being up on the, the screen? Usually it, it shows that, but I'm not sure. I can see you, Alan. Yeah, I see you, Alan. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I think we can use it. Hey, Melanie. You want that? It doesn't matter. It just all I had was just who the participants were. So, whatever you guys wanted to show. Yeah, probably be able to see the participants so you can see the hand. But just oh, uh, why is that going on? Double click. Double click on title bar. Double click. Yeah. Sorry about this. We I have a new computer and yep. I think it has to have a few settings. 
Yeah, right, let's let's do this. You get exit full screen and then if you want to put it side by side. Yeah. There you go. I'll maximize that. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. So um, now we will move on to public comment. This is a section where anybody can address the commission on any issue that is not on tonight's agenda. So I will now open it up for public comment. And let's see if we have any one attendee. And it looks like we have one hand up. So go ahead, Thomas Grover. Hi, this is Tom Grover. Um, I'm choosing to speak on non-agenda items because I don't have anything against any particular permit, prop, but the process seems to be really problematic. Um, that you are approving cannabis uh, projects in rural areas that do not have fire protection, and I guess you're getting people to sign something that says that, but that doesn't protect the community. You're approving generator grows out there. Now, I understand the problem with storing power. So generators are at least backup are absolutely essential in many of these projects. But to do this without fire safety requirements or, or anything like that is pretty silly. Uh, some of these projects are way down roads where you're going to have to bring in all sorts of diesel over very problematic roads. And this is a real issue. And I'd really like the, the planning department as well as a planning commission to consider whether this is sufficient. The other problem I have is you're, you're getting in front of your commission all sorts of large ponds varying from 1 million to 15 million gallon ponds. Uh, the, these are below the state requirement that allows the state to regulate it. And that's being thrown in the planning department. But as far as I know, <clears throat> you don't have sufficient uh, regulations to regulate these things. Now we've had many ponds over the years blow out in these rural areas from earthquakes or extreme uh, uh, water events. And I just don't think that this is really adequate. And when I looked at some of these permits in front of you, they had that they had large rainwater ponds, which is wonderful, but I don't see any engineering reports or any requirement for engineering reports to guarantee that these things will not blow out. And I really question whether you have enough regulations within the department to, to oversee these very large ponds. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, public that would like to speak on any issue that is not on the agenda tonight? Seeing none. I will close the public comment and we will move on to section E, which is the consent agenda. And the consent agenda is quite long tonight. I have um, a question for the director. Can we one do each one of these as, as one group, unless somebody pulls one, um, all the, the action summaries, and then can we include the continuance as part of the consent or do we, should we take that out and do that as a separate on uh, Matoll River Farms? Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought you were gonna say. All right, so, and the, okay to do all the rest of them yeah. together. Except for the This, okay, I, I meant the action summaries. Um, all right, so with that, we have uh, action summaries for June 4th, June 18th, June or July 23rd, August 6th, August 20th, September 3rd, and September 17th. 
Is there anybody on the commission or any public that would like any of these polls? Seeing none, I'll leave those on consent. And then we will keep, we will pass number eight, which we will handle separately. And then uh, item number 11, the Trent Sanders conditional use permit in the Dean Creek area. Is there anybody? Oh, did I miss one? I'm sorry. What about nine? nine. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Nine, I just pulled, turned two pages, sorry about that. So number nine, the Journey Aquarian conditional use permit in the uh, Harris Road area. Is there anybody that would like this item pulled from the consent agenda? Hearing none, and seeing none on the screen, I will leave that on, on consent. And then we'll move to item number 10, which is Trent Sanders conditional use permit, 30 Dean Creek Road. Is there anybody who would like this pulled from consent agenda? Hearing none, we'll leave that on consent. Move to item number 11, which is the Trent Sanders conditional use permit for 35 Dean Creek Road. Anybody who wants this item pulled? Seeing none, that will stay on consent. Uh, the next item, number 12, will be, we'll deal with that separately. <clears throat> Move on to item number 13, ABC Farms Incorporated Conditional Use Permit 2901 Loop Road for Tuna Area. Is there anybody who wants this item pulled from consent? public. Seeing none, that will stay on consent. Number 14, Petland, I hope I pronounced that right, final map subdivision and plan development permit extension, 1417 Railroad Drive, McKinleyville area. Anybody who would like this poll from consent? I see in one member of the public, this will, item number 14 will be pulled. And that goes, yeah, I, do you want me to ask if that? Yeah, uh, the director asked me to get a clarification. Was the, the caller or, that just, raised a hand to Greg Dale, was this, were you trying to pull item number 14 or item number 13? Um, can, can you unmute and let us know? Am I unmuted now? Yes. yes. Item, number, item, item number 13 was the one I was hoping to unmute. I apologize. Okay. So, Item number 13 is being pulled, not item number 14. Thank you, Director. That would have been a little bit interesting. So now I'm going to ask again on item number 14. Is there anybody that wishes to have item number 14 pulled? The Petland Final Map Subdivision on Railroad Drive in Kinleyville. Hearing none, seeing none, that will stay on consent. And that leaves us number 15, which is the cable final map subdivision and coastal development permit extension at 380 Artino Street. Is there anybody who wishes to have this item pulled? Seeing none, I will leave that on consent. So, 
Uh, I'm gonna go back through because we have so many items on the consent tonight. I'm just gonna go through and say which ones are on the consent. The All of the uh, action summaries will be on this consent, which are items one through seven. Um, item number nine, journey aquarium conditional use permit will be on consent. Number 10, Trent Sanders conditional use permit will be on consent. Number 11, Trent Sanders conditional use permit will be on consent. Item number 14, the Petland final map subdivision and plan development permit will be on, on the consent. And the final one will be the number 15, the cable final map subdivision will be on consent. So with that, would anybody like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move to approve the consent agenda, excluding number 13. And I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Seeing none, I would ask yes. for a roll call. Yes. Oh, yes. Wait. I'm sorry, yes. Mike. I so it's, the motion does not include the other items that um, may be continued that we're going to talk about. Um, should we change uh, we were, that motion? Well, those we're gonna, we were going to do as individual, I thought. So they need to be pulled, right? Okay. I, I see what you're saying. Like, so we're going to pull out of the consent agenda items number eight and item number 12, I believe it was. Yes. Sure. And, and 13. And 13. So we'll be approving everything but 8, 12, and 13. Thank you. I'll amend it such that Thank we you. exclude 8, 12, and 13. I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, could I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Oh. Not in Commissioner Pellegrini? Yes. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner O'Neill? Yes. Commissioner McTaver? Yes. Thank you. So the consent agenda, uh, agenda is approved and we will now move on to uh, item number eight, which was pulled. And that's the Matoll River Farms LLC conditional use permit on Huckleberry 569 Huckleberry Lane, Whitethorn area. So we're asking for a continuance on that to November 19th. Would anybody like to make a motion to continue this to November 19th? I'll make that motion. I'll second. So it looks like Peggy was the first and Lonnie seconded. Thank you. Any questions? I'll call for a roll call vote then, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bontio. Yes. Commissioner Pellegrini. Yes. Commissioner Newman. Yes. Commissioner O'Neill. Yes. Commissioner McCaver. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. So now we will go move on to item number 12, which is uh, the IXXCO Incorporated Conditional Use Permit <laughs> Modification on State Highway 299. And this has been asked to be moved to a date uncertain. So do I have a motion to move this item to a date uncertain? So moved. Ronnie's the first. I'll second. second. Looks like Melanie, got it. Mike, I saw your hand, but she spoke. So you get it, Melanie. All right, so uh, we have a a motion and a second. Any questions? Seeing none. 
Commissioner Baggio. Yes. Commissioner Pellegrini. Yes. Commissioner Newman. Yes. Commissioner O'Neill. Yes. And Commissioner McCaper. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And now the last item that was pulled will be item number 13, ABC Farms Conditional Use Permit 20. Um, that's public, though. Okay. I'm not seeing that. Okay, Esther, um, I'm going to let you comment. We're just curious why you're raising your hand right now. So go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Esther. I'm the owner uh, of the hotel that is right next to the building uh, that is operating the cannabis. And I want to bring attention to the commission that uh, the operation uh, affected by business very negatively. I, uh, uh, I, run, the, I run the sales uh, last year, uh, 2019 versus the year Esther, before at the same time. Esther, we'll, we will open this for public hearing on this item when we get into the item. We thought oh, maybe okay. we're, we're a holdover from some other question that you had not to do with this item. So we, you will have your, your opportunity. So later? Yes, in just a minute. Okay, i sorry. Well, this was cool. Yeah. Oh, that's right. It won't it's, be, it won't it's a date be. uncertain. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I just, we, we did continue this one to a date. Un, well, yeah, to a date uncertain. So right. you'll have to, it'll be on another meeting. So go ahead, director. Thank you. So for, for Esther and the public, this item was continued to a date uncertain, which means that we don't know what date it will be brought back in front of the Planning Commission. Before it is brought back to the Planning Commission, we will send out new notices to the public of the, notice of the public hearing. And so it, it will not come back, it will not be heard unless it is re -noticed. It will not be discussed any further tonight. Thank you, Director. I apologize for not being clear on that. Okay, all right. So with that, we will move on to the next section, which is uh, G, which are items that are up for. This is the, uh, for this is the oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I had one. Bear with me just a second. Is in my order? ABC Farms. Yeah. All right, so this was pulled. So the, the item that we are now going to discuss is, is number 13, ABC Farms Incorporated Conditional Use Permit 2901 Loop Road Fortuna. So I'd ask for a staff report. Uh, can I get permission to share my screen, please? To do what? I share, share the screen. Yes. yes permission please. to share my screen? Yes, go ahead. You can. It's, I'm working on it. Okay. Share your screen. Oops. Oops. Okay, let's give it a try now. Thank you, Director. Thank you. And Elizabeth, would you turn up your volume so that we can hear you a little, little better?
Can you guys hear me better now? Thank you, Elizabeth. That's How's that sound, John? Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Commissioner, my name is Elizabeth Moreno. I'm the assigned planner for the conditional use permit for ABC Farm. Uh, two conditional use permits, actually, and a modification. The parcel size is 7.7 .7 acres. The project is located in the Fortuna Community Planning Area. It is zoned agricultural general with the land use designation of residential estates. And the project or the site currently holds an approved zoning clearance certificate for 9,999 square feet of cannabis cultivation. It was approved in 2017. Uh, about 7,000 square feet is mixed light and 299 square feet is uh, outdoor. And um, pursuant to the 2.0 ordinance, the, app the applicant is seeking a conditional use permit to continue to cultivate without enclosing the cultivation. And is also seeking a conditional use permit to uh, for a micro business for distribution, manufacturing and uh, farm-based retail sale. And the modification is for the approved zoning clearance certificate for uh, to modify the site configuration and to reduce the mix light to 5,420 square feet and 4,579 square feet of outdoor cannabis cultivation. The water source was analyzed under the zoning clearance certificate and that is a well on site. <clears throat> the power source is provided by PJ and e No additional uh, employees are going to be required for the micro business and ABC Farms is a family operated business. <clears throat> About um, maybe um, uh, three individuals max, the, uh, the, uh, the applicant and the operator and, and uh, daughter are gonna be working the business. This right, oh, this right here is the, the approved site plan for the zoning current certificate. Uh, you have three greenhouses and uh, some pots over here and some raised beds here. This is the proposed site plan. Uh, here's a closer look. And we have three greenhouses still here. Another greenhouse proposed uh, right here. Same raised beds, but what is different is that the uh, outdoor cultivation is going to be uh, on within six rows right here. The manuf uh, manufacturing aspect of the project is going to be occurring in the existing barn, the first floor, and that is located here. Um, the distribution is also going to be only for the applicant to go to other businesses to sell the product. <clears throat> and the farm, uh, the farm based retails will also allow the applicant to go to uh, distribution facilities and uh, dispensaries to sell her own product directly. There's not going to be any in, uh, people coming to her site to buy any product. She's going to be going to um, these areas of, of licensed facilities to sell her product and to go back real quick on the manufacturing aspect is going to be non volatile no flammable stuff um, she'll be using dry ice methods to separate the oils from the plants and also uh, heated plates to extract the oils there has been a few concerns from the community and uh, <clears throat> the, the letters are, are within your staff report before you. The main concerns is order from the other cultivation. The applicant has addressed um, many of the concerns um, brought forward by the community members. And um, for example, 
she has um, talked to directly to these individuals. She's also uh, uh, prepared a win assessment of Fortuna, looking at the topography and the <clears throat> geography of where she's located. And the meteorologist wrote a report and is also found in your staff report in attachment four. And as you can see in this image here, uh, about 74% of the wind blows out of the this neighbor right here and uh, this other neighbor right here. And it, um, about 15% of the winds patterns go out directly from here. As you can see, there's kind of like some uh, a, a um, some a forested area right here that kind of takes the wind out that way. Additionally, the applicant has modified her project to to uh, meet the you know to address the neighbor's concerns. She has a proposed veggie garden on this side, as you can see on this on the side pan right here. And she's also um, she's also going to be planting uh, scented and um, flowers that smell pleasurably on that side of the uh, bordering the uh, fence right here. So if if windows pick up, that's the first thing that is going to be blowing out that way. And lastly, uh, the applicant has also um, done a lot of community outreach. She's been out there. She talks. She has uh, acquired 59 signatures for the community uh, of the community members who support her project. And this site plan right here has been submitted by the applicant to kind of give you an illustration of all the people that have supported her project around the community. And this is also um, the petition is also um, in your staff report. So with with um, the evidence of, of what we have from the applicant, <clears throat> we uh, staff is recommending approval of the project and we uh, recommend that the planning commission find the project consistent with the environment environmental impact report and the addendum prepared for this project and make the required findings for approval. If staff, uh, if uh, planning commissioners are not able to make the, uh, the findings for approval, staff recommends to find the project exempt from environmental impact uh, review pursuant to section 15 to 70 of the CICA guidelines of the, and deny the proposed conditional use permit and modification. The applicant is in the audience and I am also, I cannot answer any questions you guys might have. Give me a second here. So does any of the commissioners have questions for staff? Yeah, Good question. Go ahead. Um, I'm looking at the petition from the neighbors and the petition says, please allow them to continue with their present cannabis license, both with mixed light and outdoors. Doesn't say anything about it, a change or increase in the outdoor permit that they're well, applying for here. Um, the, um, the applicant has an approved zoning current certificate for uh, 7,000 square feet of mixed light and uh, 2,200, I mean, excuse me, 2,999 square feet of outdoor cultivation. So she is basically asking um, for her to continue as, as is um, without it fully enclosing the, the uh, cultivation uh, with odor mitigation measures like scrubbers oh. and stuff like industrial size uh, greenhouses. So this is for her to continue with her project that, that um, has been approved in 2017. Yeah, you missed my point. It, it's an increase in the outdoor cultivation, a decrease on the mixed. 
but the outdoor uh, is the question. Well, um, Commissioner, uh, the mixed light currently doesn't have any uh, odor mitigation measures. So it's, it's still considered open air cultivation, even though um, the mixed light, it, 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 you know, they're not gonna be using as much artificial lighting, but it has been operating with open air cultivation. That answer, director. Did you want to chime in? I you came up. I thought. Yeah. yeah. No, I did. I I think Miss Moreno did a great job of answering that. Okay. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Mike? Or do you have any further questions for? Or I move. Okay. Um, I okay. believe she answered that by with the mixed light in the greenhouses being open air meaning that the air flows in and out of those just as if they're outdoors. Has there been any study correct. about, has there been any study about any increase? We, we can't hear you, Mike. You just kind of went no okay. volume. How about now? That's better. That, okay. I guess I got to move in direct way of the microphone here. Um, so has there been any studies or uh, notice that we have about um, the mixed use versus outdoor being either more fragrant or not as fragrant or what? Anything like that? Uh, go ahead, Director. Yeah, I, I think un unfortunately, uh, Commissioner Newman, there, there are, we don't have those studies. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ronnie, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. I was looking through the um, recommended conditions of approval and I'm, I must be missing it, but I didn't see any requirements for any um, maintenance of the road or road improvements. If, if I'm remembering this correctly, isn't it a gravel, graveled road shared by other neighbors and that would have an impact? Um, the, uh, the road is not gravel, it, it is paved, and um, I believe that uh, Public Works have recommended approval, and their approval has uh, basically, um, because I think that it's, it's, a, it's a functional capacity road, however, um, they don't want to see another project pop up on the road, and so that was the only thing that Public Works uh, notified me of, uh, of regarding the road, but it is paved. Okay, thank and you. it's actually, yeah, and uh, it encroaches, uh, Loop Road encroaches Ronerville uh, Road. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, Melanie, you have your hand up. Oh, yes, thank you. So um, we did receive a, a few comments regarding the extraction and uh, I just wanted to point out that supercritical carbon dioxide is um, extremely safe with negligible environmental impact. And uh, also ethanol extraction is as well. And um, so, uh, you know, from an impact point of view, those don't concern me. Um, addressing the odor, uh, it, it all depends on the strain so if it were something that the planning department or the commission wanted to look at, that could be a factor in, in permitting. There, there would be re no reason why there wouldn't be. Uh, some strains are very, very high in odor, much like, you know, you can have an oregano that smells really strongly. It's because it's higher in terpenes. And uh, same thing goes for cannabis. So like most plants. So the more of those it has, the more it smells. And um, unfortunately, if you don't like the smell of strong plants, uh, the terpenes are becoming more popular. Like those strains are more popular to grow because they're more important in the medicinal industry. So I just thought that might be helpful. That's all. 
Thank you, Melanie. Any other questions for staff before I open this for public comment? I just so want to clarify that. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. I, want, I wanted to clarify if I may through the chair. Um, I did um, do um, receiving these letters. I did check with court enforcement today and I asked if there has if there has been uh, within the four years of cultivation on site if there has been any odor complaints and um, I think I saw one at the very beginning of her receiving her conditional use permit but we haven't received or at least code enforcement enforcement hasn't received uh, any formal complaints of odor on site. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, seeing no more questions for staff, I will move, open this up for public comment. And is there any public that would like to speak on this issue? Okay, uh, the first hand I see up is Greg Dale. And you need to unmute your mic. Thank you, Chair Bonjo. Uh, my name is Greg Dale. And we are uh, immediately adjacent to this project, and and as a as a, a general rule, we we don't oppose this. I think the 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 issue is that these these grows there's there's two grows surrounding us are are really grows that are in a residential neighborhood. Um, they are zoned for you know they they're AE but they are surrounded by by people who live in homes and there's you know there has been several um complaints about odor um and and, and as a rule the the wind blows yeah we 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 definitely you know sometimes we smell it sometimes we don't sometimes it's very bad sometimes it's not i will say that the 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 adjacent grower at, at on Pampas Lane has, has by and large addressed the vast majority of his odor issues with with um, with big fans and, and filters and, and I think that that has addressed the odor issue and it brings up another issue they're rather loud so you sit here at night and you listen to you know a bunch of big fans running and you wouldn't think that would would drive you crazy except for we live in a fairly quiet place and and fans running you know 24 7 actually do drive you crazy anyways um so this grow is has has not had any effort have not put any efforts into addressing smell and we get very very strong odors from them um, on, on a fairly routine basis and and like emily showed in her in her report the wind blows predominantly um to the west um and or out of the north uh, the northwest and that does it does sometimes blow it away from us blows it onto somebody else um i think the vast majority of, of people that are opposed to the smell and i and i say the smell not the not the not the industry are are you know they're they're getting callous to the fact that you guys don't do anything about it and i and i apologize for saying that but it, it took a long time to get anything done for the the grow right next to us that's within you have 30 seconds sir okay i i would i would ask that they not increase their outdoor grow um their outdoor uh space and in fact, put odor uh, odor attenuation devices on their greenhouses and anything they have outside. It is a problem. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Uh, is there any other public that would like to speak? I don't. I see some other public, but I don't see any hands up. So put your hand up if you wish to speak. Okay, uh, I see one. Uh, Linda Cesaretti, please. Hmm? Oh, that's the applicant. Okay, go ahead. I, I asked you just to wait till the end, but it doesn't appear anybody else is 
has their hand up, so I'm going to let you speak now. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. Um, you can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, since we moved to Fortuna about 18 years ago, uh, I've been involved with my four children and um, in their schools and in all their extracurricular activities. Whether it was chaperoning, field trips, baking cookies, or cleaning up after steak and sober, I helped wherever it was needed. I was on the board of directors for 88 Can Do, ran the Bridgeville Community Center for years, was a 4-H leader, a volunteer lifeguard for the Scotia swim team, and a foster care mom. I helped my husband set up his engineering firm, CES, and was the company's bookkeeper for years. In April, we will have been married for 30 years. Just wanted to share you a little bit about myself. About five years ago, we started researching cannabis. Learning about the history and science of cannabis changed our negative views of the sacred plant. When Humboldt County began permitting cannabis farms, we talked to our sons who were already in the industry and decided to begin our own farm. We put our life savings into building ABC farms. The more I learn about cannabis, the more I love it. Farming cannabis has made me a better steward of our property. We are developing living soils as a regenerative farm, using environmentally sustainable practice and making organic products. The Grown in Humble Appalachians program recently signed uh, by Governor Newsom, SB 185, is the de designation we want to be part of. This requires us to grow outdoors and in our native soils. ABC stands for apples, buds, and cider. Our original product was hard apple cider, which by the way, we won the gold medal for at the Humboldt County Fair. Getting the micro business permit would allow us to market our products directly to dispensaries and achieve a recognizable brand that people can trust. I got my business degree at Cal State Northridge where I specialized in marketing. And I look forward to once again, using my education now that our nest is empty. I have seen how cannabis can change people's lives and I believe our products will meet the needs of many. Cannabis CBD products have tons of potential. Scientists are discovering and learning more about it almost daily. I study under Dr. Dustin Sulak and re read research papers on cannabis regularly. Cannabis medicine is my passion. I love educating people about it whenever I get the opportunity. We ask that you please approve this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And I'd like to speak too. I'm her husband. Can I have three minutes also? You may. Um, commissioners, thank you for your time. I hope being number 13 on the agenda is not bad luck. My <laughs> name is Kirk Cesaretti and my wife Linda and I own ABC Farms. I was born and raised in Eureka, Eureka High School class of 80. I'm a civil engineer licensed in nine states and own Cesaretti Engineered Solutions in Fortuna. As a civil engineer, I have worked with many local contractors and engineering offices. I'm a member of the Fortuna Chamber of Commerce, Fortuna Bis uh, Business District. This is my day job. After work and on the weekends, I'm my wife's farm laborer. I've enjoyed building a family farm that produces a commodity that helps people. I have long standing roots in Fortuna. My Civil War veteran great great grandfather's grave is less than two miles from our house. I deeply appreciate our community and want its betterment. I was a scoutmaster of American Legion Troop 205 in Fortuna for years, where both my sons became Eagle Scouts. I was president of the Scotia Shark Swim Team during the last years of the pool's use, a 4-H leader and homework helper for four children. It pains me that Fortuna is sometimes an aggressive anti-cannabis community. I believe this will change. The economic void <clears throat> created from the collapsed timber industry has been partially filled with the cannabis industry and this should be a good thing. We believe we are good neighbors carrying community members and run two businesses that are a part of Humboldt County's economy. I understand people have complained about traffic. The proposed non-storefront micro business will not increase loop road traffic. The wind study performed by a meteorologist demonstrates that the majority of the cannabis aromas that come from, that, that have been complained about are not from our farm. 
Matter of fact, we we can't even smell our farm farm uh, just south of the farm regularly. It's it's not noteworthy to us. We are believers in high CBD producing cannabis and its medicinal help as a whole plant as opposed to the CBD provided by hemp with no THC. The best way to grow this strain of cannabis, 20 to one and five to one strains is outdoors and in native soil. Requiring us to move our farm indoors would diminish our product's medicinal value. Thank you for your time listening. Thank you. Um, any questions for the, I, I'll ask the, the panelists if there's any questions for the, the, the uh, applicants. I, I do, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the att uh, attendees and I see Natalie Blapp has her hand up. So go ahead, Natalie. You there, Natalie? There I am. Okay. <laughs> that was a little confusing. Um, good evening, Commissioners. Natalie DeLapp, Humboldt County Growers Alliance. Um, I just want to speak in support of ABC Farms. Um, the Cesarati family have been our members for the past several years. And, you know, their story that they just told you is part of the community that is what is making Humboldt's cannabis industry uniquely special. Um, and that what they're trying to accomplish with the micro business license was one of the fundamental tenets of Prop 64 when that law was passed by the voters of California was to allow really small farms to be able to have that kind of consumer direct access. And the only way a farmer can do that is by getting all of these license types. And so, you know, this distribution, it means taking the product from point A to point B. This is not heavy industrial distribution. Um, the manufacturing is small batch, non-volatile manufacturing. And then specifically this outdoor cultivation, as, as was stated, and I, I'm just making sure that I'm interpreting, it would actually move more of the mixed light into outdoor, which means less fans. And so that means less noise because plants that are just growing outside under the sun aren't making a lot of noise. They do smell, but they smell like terpenes, as Melanie said, and those terpenes are part of the medicine that brings the healing properties of that plant to the users. And you know, with the family growing high CBD hemp, not hemp, what they're able to do is they're paying back measure S taxes, they're making sure that all of these environmental rules are followed, and they're actually creating a product that is cleaner and better for the end user than just this bulk hemp that's coming off the market. Um, and then finally, this Appalachian law that was just signed by Gavin Newsom at the end of September is very specific that in order to enroll and participate in this Appalachian program, folks need to be growing in the ground under full sun. And that is where we get the terroir of cannabis and humble. And I really look forward to seeing this project approved, seeing what this family is able to bring to the community. And I ask you to please vote yes and approve this project this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Is there any more public that would like to participate? Uh, Megan Seeley. Go ahead. There you go. I just had um, a question. So when I was approached with a petition to sign, it sounded like it was a very small mom and pop operation. But as I'm reading about um, separating oils and creating bubble hash and extracting uh, cannabis oils, um, it concerns me that um, is there a higher chance of fires or, you know, anything like that with this type of um, modifications, I guess. Uh, 
we'll come back after public comment and the director will address that. Any other public comments? Seeing none, I'm gonna close the public comment period and bring it back to the commission. Would you like to address that now? I'm gonna let the director address the last caller's question. So Elizabeth Moreno, would you describe the um, manufacturing activities that are involved here and what would be involved, what would be stored on the site and the difference between uh, volatile and non-volatile manufacturing extraction? Um, yes, um, it's Elizabeth Moreno here. Is it okay if I may? Um, the applicant is mainly using, uh, for example, like two heated plates, and like kind of what I've read about is just two heated plates squeezing out the oils of the cannabis, and also like taking the raw plant and freezing it, um, freezing it, and uh, that extracts the oils as well. And the uh, the other medium of using ethanol is a non-volatile. It doesn't use any flames or whatsoever, and they won't be uh, they won't be a risk of like uh, an explosion or something like that at all. Um, the the methods are primarily and, and as a fact, as I talk to the applicant, she says primary freezing cultivation and and uh, and using the the press that um, extracts the oils. Thank you. I would just like to add to that that uh, the commission will recall that two point application or two point ordinance restricts um, flammable extraction from being done in these kinds of areas. Thank you, director, for that. So with that, uh, I will bring it back to the commission. And is there any questions from commissioners? Any discussion on this? I could make a motion. Yeah, well, we could have that too. I figured I'd give everybody a chance to they want to talk about it anymore. But if somebody would like to make a motion, I'll let you do that too. Are you making an offer? Oh, yeah, no. okay, I'll, I'll motion to approve the conditional use permit for ABC Farms, record number PLN 15976, um, APN 202-171-006, uh, and that's on 2901 Loop Road in the Fortuna area. We have a motion, do we have a second? A second. And Peggy, a second. Is there any more discussion about the motion? Seeing none, I will ask Suzanne for the, to ask the question. All right, thank you. Commissioner Baggio. Yes. Commissioner Pellegrini. Yes. Commissioner O'Neill. Yes. Commissioner Newman. Yes. Commissioner McTaver. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And now we will move on to discussion of public works. What was that? Sorry. Um, yeah, I believe that's where we're at. We are moving on to item G, which is dis the discussion item of public works. Thank you. So I think a staff report, what, however, we're going to start this. Good evening, Commissioners. Bob Rumpel, Deputy Director, Humboldt County Public Works. Bob. Apologize for the background noise of the barking dog. <laughs> uh, tonight, uh, it's my understanding that we want to begin a dialogue of some of the subdivision requirements, particularly regarding sidewalks 
in urban and urbanizing areas and where sidewalks should be provided versus areas where sidewalks perhaps may not necessarily be needed in those circumstances. Uh, I've prepared several slides that I'd like to, to share with the commission that might help illustrate some of the types of roads that might be more suitable for it, as well as types of roads where sidewalks are now being desperately needed, or at least some form of uh, pedestrian facility. Uh, do I have permission to share my screen? So at this point, hopefully everyone's seeing a subdivision that looks like it has six homes on it, all with gray roofs and a nice white concrete dry aisle. Is that showing up? Yes. All right. So this is a small pocket type subdivision where you have uh, three of the homes in the front that front the major road taking direct access off the major road and you have a small flag lot or a small flag serving three lots in the back that are all sharing that same common road. In this particular instance, it's uh, three properties in the back all sharing the same narrow road. There's no sidewalk facilities for it. And I believe the road is about uh, 16 feet wide or perhaps upwards of 20 feet. I don't remember the exact distance in this particular case. This is a case where you have a series of small lots. Or should say, you have a short road that's serving a limited number of lots where the need for pedestrian facilities on it is very limited and perhaps not necessary in these particular cases. The next one is a slightly longer road. This road is about 300 feet long. It is a also a non-county maintained road, much like the first one. And this particular road is serving six residential units off of it and this road is about uh, 12 feet wide. And this road seems to function just fine for having six units on it without having any sort of pedestrian facilities. This one is another example of a high density subdivision where two homes up at the top of the screen are fronting the major road and there's a small little flag that leads in and serves four units off of it. So the total length of this road, including the flag, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 feet for total road length. The next example is a similar sort of configuration, but laid out more geographically based upon the available land and the terrain. Here you have four units served by a 16 to 18 foot wide travelway and no sidewalk improvements within it. This one is Golf Course Road up in the Arcata area. This is one of the roads that started out as a rural road over time the area began to urbanize with more and more subdivisions occurring on it, the density increasing. And this is one of the roads where the county receives a lot of concerns from the public regarding the lack of pedestrian facilities. And the county has been looking at uh, meeting with the community to discuss options of what could be done on this sort of a road. So this is an example where you do have that narrow country road 
where everyone wants to live off of it, but then it doesn't have any pedestrian facilities. And once people are out there, they're looking for the pedestrian facilities, even though they were wanting that country road field. And then the last example I have is Ocean Drive in McKinleyville. Again, very similar to Golf Course Road in Arcata. This road's a little bit wider. It does have a centerline stripe on it. It does have piecemeal sidewalks that have been constructed over the years as development has occurred, but there is not any connectivity with the piecemeal sidewalks that were constructed out there. Public Works has just started a community outreach program with the community to discuss what can be done to improve non-pedestrian access on this road. So with that, let me switch back to my face. So with that, I wanted to share these different examples of roads where there clearly are cases where development can occur, where sidewalks are not necessarily needed. Yet at some point, the pendulum is going to swing and we're going to reach the point where the road is just serving too many properties and you do need to go ahead and have those sorts of pedestrian facilities added to it. And I think this is an important discussion to have because it, it stems from the general plan update when we talked about the countywide transportation plan in an effort to go ahead and figure out how, to, how do we go ahead and update our road sections to make sure that they're appropriate for the times. Many of the road standards that we're looking at are from the vintage of the 1970s. We're clearly beyond the 1970s at this point. The needs of the communities have changed. And this is an opportunity to begin a dialogue to figure out the next steps of should we be looking at updating these standards? And if so, should we look at focusing on the urban interface with the sidewalks as perhaps a first step into this and how this could apply throughout the county as a way to not only encourage development in the urbanized areas, but ensure that development is help kept affordable, especially in light of the housing shortage that the county and the state is facing. With that, I'll conclude my presentation. All right. Uh, Director Bronco, could I, one thing I noticed, and I don't think you pointed this out, um, could you explain the difference between, before we open it up for discussion, between county maintained and non-county maintained? Because three of those, those uh, subdivisions that you showed there, in my eyes, would be non-county maintained, and there's a big difference there. So. It, I think it'd be helpful for the public and for the other commissioners to, to understand the differences. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. That, that is a very important designation that uh, does need to be discussed a bit further. In the case of county maintained roads, the county is obligated to go ahead and provide pedestrian facilities in urban areas. Obviously, when you're out on Matoll Road or Alder Point Road, out in the middle of nowhere, we're not gonna have sidewalks on our extreme rural roads, but in urban areas, it is something that is required to be provided and that those routes need to be made uh, accessible under the federal and state ADA requirements. Now, in the case of these smaller little flag lot subdivisions that we showed in the slides, those roads are not maintained by the county they are maintained by the people that use those roads. And it's up to those people to go ahead and provide for the care and maintenance of those roads. ADA may or may not directly apply to the residential use. If it is a commercial use, clearly it applies and paths to travel do need to be provided to the uh, public road. But in the case of residential, 
it is my understanding that accessible sidewalks from the residential units to the public road are not, it's, it's not a requirement of residential development. Did that answer your question? I think it, it went part way there. We'll, uh, we'll go and, and open it up to the rest of the commission and I'm sure it'll come back around to some of those questions. Uh, I see Melanie has her hand up. So go ahead, Melanie. Melanie, go ahead and unmute yourself. Get your hand up. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm glad we're coming back to this subject. When we first discussed it quite a few months ago now, maybe a year ago, um, uh, I, I brought up the issue of sidewalks um, because sidewalks are really important, you know, for uh, to support the way society is going, where we have more people on their bicycles and scooters and walking and what have you. So I'm, I'm not in favor of getting rid of sidewalks. And as you might recall at the time, what I asked you is to uh, look into alternative sidewalk materials. So for example, nationally sidewalks cost between two and $300,000 per block. It's really expensive. And then it's another $35 a square foot to repair them. They're easily damaged, um, especially in less moderate climates than we have, <laughs> but uh, it's not the best material and it's not the most environmentally material and it's also extremely expensive. So I would like us to be looking at the alternatives. So for example, in Washington, they just put a huge chunk of their budget, although way less than they used to, into stamped asphalt. So, you know, it's really simple. You don't even have to have a separate sidewalk necessarily. You could put planter boxes or even curb blocks for a laneway on the road if there's room, or you can simply continue and have a stamped asphalt sidewalk. And these are far, far, far cheaper than concrete sidewalks. So, and they still provide the access that people are looking for, especially in subdivisions and, you know, walkable neighborhoods. So I was kind of hoping you had done more research on that um, and maybe you have. So those are my comments and my question. Thanks. Do any of the other commissioners have questions for Mr. Brothel? No. Okay, I will chime in a little bit. Um, my concerns were a little bit different, I think, than what Melanie brought up. I'm, I'm more interested in having a discussion how we can get to more affordability in housing, and that that's where my thoughts on how we could change some of the requirements from the public works end of it. Um, as I spoke before, I, I pay great attention when I go into other areas uh, about how they do things. Um, and I see many areas where you see very few sidewalks, um, not usually in the, the downtown urban area, but out in, in more of the suburban area. Um, I'd like to see looking at some of the alternatives of, of getting more to that, not putting curb gutter and sidewalk and having class four roads uh, requirements, which is pretty much the go-to at the county for any subdivision, um, with maybe the exception when you do a planned unit development, like a, a couple of the examples that were shown. But I'd like to see, instead of having curb gutter and sidewalk, the possibility of maybe having biking, walking paths, and maybe just a swell to deal with the water. Uh, instead of having all this cement and that costs a small fortune to do. I'm in the development business. One of the biggest costs we have is putting the roads and the improvements in. Um, 
That's why you won't see me doing any more subdivisions. That's why you don't see very many coming before us. Um, the cost is just too high and the requirements are too high. I'd like to see some of the, the um, outside the box thinking that we've seen come with the requirements we did for the cannabis industry because we basically have removed all the requirements and just made it a, a self-certification program. Now, I think that's went too far, but that's my opinion. I'd like to see somewhere in between. I, I, I think there has to be something more than just this is the county standard and that's what you're going to do if you want to do a development. I mean, there are, we're, we at the County of Humboldt are making people that just do one lot splits, put a sidewalk out in front of it, and there's not a sidewalk on the whole rest of the street. So you have a sidewalk nowhere and you have to put barricades up at each end of it so that the people that go up on that sidewalk can't fall off when they get to the end. I mean, at some point, common sense has to play into some of this and we have to get away from there's only one way to do things. Other communities have done it. I think I have strong hopes that we can do it here. I mean, we've obviously did it here because we did it for the cannabis industry. So that's the kind of thing I'd like to see some out of the outside the box thinking, not just status quo. You know, the the other point I'm going to make is doing subdivisions, both private and publicly done subdivisions, meaning doing private road maintenance association on the private ones and doing them that meet all the county standards. <laughs> neither, neither option is that good. Nobody wants to be part of a homeowners association. They very seldom function real well. And the cost of doing all the public requirements is getting so astronomical, you just aren't going to have subdivisions. So there has to be some meeting in the middle, some middle ground that can be can be found to make it more cost effective. Um, I, I don't know what all the answers are. I just know that when you have dead end roads, they don't need to be a class four road, you know, that we, we see pushed all the time. There needs to be options. And that's what I was hoping this discussion would lead to because the discussion always ends up that how are we going to get more affordable housing? And this, if you don't have a good foundation, you're not going to get affordable housing. This is the foundation that we have to start with. And that's getting some kind of cost effective way to make the projects happen. Um, I'll leave it at that and, and come back to, I see Mike has his hand up. So go ahead, Mike. Well, after um, Melanie and your remarks uh, reminding me about this whole episode that brought this forward of why we wanted to discuss it more. It reminds me exactly that's what we're trying to do is make it more affordable, make it more affordable uh, to build and um, do some common sense things. I like some of the ideas that Melanie put forth um, maybe some gravel too, but that's what I'd like to see is alternatives as opposed to um, concrete sidewalks and the curb and, and gutter requirements. Thank you, Mike. I see Melanie has her hand up. Is that from before or is that an up and Oh, down? no, yeah. I just wanted to say, yeah, we 100% agree. I mean, the, the, the way to bring down costs is to look at the alternatives. And, you know, we have some great alternatives out there that are just so much cheaper than concrete and so much more environmentally responsible. And um, I, yeah, I 100% agree. We have to bring the, the cost down. And I think it's a good way to start. Um, I thought it was interesting you brought up the, you know, comparison with other industries because it is, it is a lot more. And if you look at some of the other countries, um, environmental impact assessment processes, you know, we have what's called uh, class screenings for, you know, smaller developments or construction projects and, you know, for a whole lot of other things too. And what that means is that you don't have to do a full NEGDEC or EIR for each one of those if it falls within kind of, it's kind of like a master 
um, EIR approach. If it falls within that, then it becomes, you know, ministerial, which is ultimately what the cannabis was meant to be. So, I mean, it would be great if we could do something like that. Um, perhaps somebody at the planning department will look into that. Uh, might be might be more difficult here in the state. Um, but yeah, I, I think we all agree on that. There are a lot of easy alternatives out there now to provide the access for pedestrians and cyclists and, and everything, but at the same time, bringing the cost way down and the maintenance and the maintenance for the county as well, also way down. So in the cases where the county is responsible. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah. Any of the it. other commissioners have comments? Would Mr. Bronco like to comment on any of our comments? <laughs> <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. I think one of the biggest challenges that the department is faced with is implementing federal and state ADA requirements. There are very stringent requirements without much wiggle room in it. And the challenge that we've seen as we have uh, been reviewing them to make sure that our improvements are in fact compliant with it is that certain materials can be more difficult to make ADA compliant than other materials are. When you start dealing with non-hard surfaces, your gravel type surfaces, those require constant maintenance in order to go ahead and keep them within ADA spec. So while you might have a lower initial installation cost, the cost over the long haul is going to be much greater in the constant grading and regrading and reshaping of those surfaces in order to go ahead and maintain the tight tolerances that are required by ADA. But with that being said, there are still things that can be done to go ahead and provide access and perhaps the a, a slightly different way. Uh, one project that comes to mind is the Beaupre subdivision up in McKinleyville, which is the uh, area uh, just to the north of uh, Beaupre Golf Course that, that's ultimately going to go ahead and connect through to Norton Road. These are larger lots, so it's a kind of a suburban subdivision. I think all the lots are about an acre in size. And the roads in the subdivision do not have traditional sidewalks on them. They have uh, shoulders for bicyclists and pedestrians to go ahead and share mm -hmm. as a way to go ahead and use the roadway. So there's no on-street parking in this particular subdivision because the lots are larger in size and it's expected that when the lots are developed, appropriate parking will be provided on site for not only the residents of the house, but also their guests. So there's a case where you can have those sorts of uses all within the uh, asphalt road. In other cases, when you start getting into more of a urbanized downtown core where on-street parking is expected, now you're also combining to the mix parked cars, the need for bicyclists and pedestrians, as well as moving cars. And that's a lot of traffic to go ahead and address, especially as the road handles more and more houses. So when a road is short and handles very few houses, the demands on the road from a traffic generation standpoint are much less than they are on a through road or a longer cul-de-sac that has many, many more homes on it. But those are <clears throat> our good points. Uh, Public Works is always open to exploring alternative materials that could be equally as cost-effective that also do comply with ADA as an effort to go ahead and do something. The stamped asphalt complies. <laughs> some, some of the challenges we've seen with asphalt is the ability to go ahead and control the cross slope to keep the cross slope under 2%. Sometimes that can be 
an issue. And if you don't put it in right, then you got to take it out and put it back in a second time. So there, 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 there are problems with concrete too. <clears throat> yes. The, the one benefit the concrete does have is you do set forms ahead of time. You can check your forms and you have a bit better control in achieving grades that are less than 2%. In theory, the, the asphalt paver should be able to do it as well. But if it's if something happens, you're at the point of needing to go ahead and figure out how to retrofit it or tear it out and replace it. That's just the, I guess that's the biggest challenge with improvements and in, in them needing to be ADA compliant is the tight tolerances and the extra care that needs to take place during their construction, regardless of the material that's being used. Thank you. Uh, Bob, I have a question for you, seeing no other hands. Um, so the, was it the Baywood subdivision you were describing? That's the acre lots up, or was it Beaupre's? So. Beaupre. Bo Beaupre's, sorry about that. So I'm gonna assume that since it was done acre lots and it wasn't done with the streets to county, their normal standards, that must be a private subdivision, privately maintained roads. The, there is a main road going through there that's part of the general plan circulation route and that is a public road. And I think along that road, there's also a call for a class one trail as well. So that road is set up with, uh, I wanna say two 10 foot wide travel lanes, two four foot shoulders. It does have the uh, earthen swales for drainage. And then on one side of the road, there's a, a, a class one trail that's required by the McKinleyville community plan. The little cul-de-sacs coming off of it are not proposed to be county maintained, but the developer could petition the county to maintain them through a permanent road division. So it sounds like you're you're doing exactly some of the things that we've been talking about in that situation. That's I I would would have not thought that that was a county maintained road. I would have thought that was a privately maintained road. So that's that, exactly where we need to get to. And and that's getting into the context of the density of the particular neighborhood of what you're seeing occurring out there. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to illustrate with these examples is that in a highly dense situation and the roads have a higher ADT to it, that's when there seems to be a higher need and a higher demand for the public to have these pedestrian facilities versus in a more of a rural setting where a shoulder can function just fine for pedestrians to go ahead and use and share with bicyclists. So well, I'm, I'm, go ahead. what I was going to suggest that might be a good next step is perhaps what I could do is come back with a series of uh, slides that would be applicable for different types of densities to get an idea of what could be done under different density situations from your 5,000 square foot lot type subdivisions your one acre lot suburban type subdivisions to kind of give an idea of here's the appropriate level of pedestrian access that should be provided for these types of projects. Is that something that the commission's interested in? Yes. I would also ask that you come back with at with those levels, what is required as far as ADA requirements so and to to see if by going say because earlier you said if it was a private subdivision you wouldn't necessarily have to meet all the ADA standards as if it is a public maintained subdivision now I'd understand at the say the entrance of the subdivision where it met the county uh, maintained road whatever that road is that area would would have to, to meet the current ADA standards, but 
possibly within that subdivision. So when you started going down the road into the subdivision, that you may be able to not have all those requirements put on the developer or the homeowner or whoever is, is doing it. Um, that could could be a huge uh, savings for development. That's why you know houses are four hundred thousand now, and and ten years ago they were in the two hundred thousands in in Humboldt County. That's a big part of it. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but that's the improvement costs have went through the roof. So um, I think anything you can come up with. I mean, I, I understand that you were the the uh, brainchild behind coming up with with different standards for for the cannabis industry. We, that's exactly the ingenuity we need to come up with to uh, meet the housing needs of Humboldt County. So I'm sure you can do it. Well, thank you for the vote of confidence with that. The one thing I would like to throw out there is if there are a small group within the planning commission that wish to collaborate with public works on this endeavor i'd be open to jointly working with them as well to help hopefully get a few more brains together to look over things before things are presented back to the entire commission um i think that would be great uh, I see Mike has a, we will ask that here in a second and see if there's anybody that would like. I'd certainly be interested, but Mike has a question for you, I believe. Go ahead, Mike. Well, not so much a question, but um, um, just a attaboy type thing that we need to get creative. We need to really look at some things, be um, as open as possible. Affordability is so important. and having some options um, and having that known ahead of time, I believe is important uh, to spur growth or building in an affordable manner. So um, whatever you can do there, Bob, and anybody else that's helping you, that's what I, I'm asking. Anybody else have questions or comments to Bob? I, I'll make a comment. Uh, I like your idea of uh, getting together with um, the commissioners. I might also suggest that you uh, reach out to some of the, the developers, if you can find them in the county, guys that have, have done it. Uh, the one that would come to my mind probably First and foremost would be former commissioner Kevin McKinney. Um, he can, he's also an engineer. I bet you he'd have some great ideas uh, as to what could possibly happen. Um, he also has developed in other areas, something that I haven't had the opportunity to do, but out of, of Eureka or out of Humboldt County and out of state even. So he has a broader idea of what can happen out there. So I think maybe reaching out to him would be a, a, a great idea to be part of your research and discussion. Um, I would gladly volunteer to be part of that. And I would encourage anybody else who, who wants to. Um, so I think. I, I'd definitely be interested in being part of that community discussion. All right. Well, there's two, can't get too many or we'll have a quorum, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely interested too. And I was just going to say the same thing, um, Chair, that there are, you know, it would, it'd be a great opportunity to bring in some of the developers as well. I know, uh, well, I think Chris Start at Danco would be interested and uh, Kurt Kramer, you know, there are, I think uh, quite a few people would be really interested in participating in something like that. Those are both great suggestions. Um, so Bob, uh, from there, I'm, I'm assuming, are you gonna reach out to these people or is that something that 
we should do as a commission or I, I'm not sure where we go. This is new territory. So that's where you have a thought. Yeah, I, I think I don't want to step on uh, Bob's toes here, but we can reach out and facilitate the discussion, set up meetings and, and, uh, and just kind of go with uh, what the discussion leads to and take a little time with it if it's productive and before we bring something back for the commission. Sounds good. Would it be advisable for us to form like an ad hoc committee that will deal with this I mean, for a one-time issue or I, I, I think you just did. You've got three. Okay. But we didn't do anything formal. I, I guess yes. that's what if if you want to take a vote on that, you're you can. I don't know that we we need to, but no. Nope. Okay, I'm comfortable no. without without having it, but uh, I think it's a good idea and I think it's a good start. So why don't you uh, take this and run with it, Bob, and then let us know when you'd like are ready to get together. And if you want to reach out to some of those names that are have been thrown out, I think that would be great to have them involved as well but um uh, chairman i think having um um our our um planning commission um with john ford reaching out to a few inviting them to do that that we're forming an ad hoc committee that we formed it and we've got some commissioners on there and we're looking for affordable uh ways to um, build houses and, and not have as many uh, rules as much as we can with in regards to sidewalks and stuff and anything else that may come to mind there. I think that would be um, the way that you would want to get that done. It puts a little bit more of an oomph behind it um, that it will be going to the Planning Commission. So you're saying you would like to formally inform the ad hoc committee. Uh, you've done it. That you've you've formed the ad hoc committee, and um, you've got the initial off. part. You're going to ask if for I a few more participants. Okay, directed like. <laughs> so, if, if I understand Commissioner Newman's point correctly, he asked you that uh, I, in particular, uh, send the invitation to developers. Convey the significance that the Planning Commission has placed on this and has actually put together an ad hoc committee to participate, really it's their participation to get a, a full range of options and a robust discussion, if, if I understood that correctly. That, that sounds correct. great. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like everybody's in agreement, so we will leave it in your court to round up the troops and at the time. The, the primary stakeholder group for this is probably going to be the Humboldt uh, or the Northern California Home Builders Association. Uh, I'm not sure how active that group is currently. The last I heard from one of the prominent builders in the community is that group hasn't been too, too active, but at, at least reaching out to them could be a great way to disseminate the information to others in an effort to go ahead and, and try to build a fairly strong, robust ad hoc committee where there could be a, a good exchange of information and ideas to be able to come forward. And I, I think initially with this, I would recommend that we first focus on uh, urban and suburban type standards and not really dwell into rural sort of situations because it's the urban and suburban interfaces where the pedestrian needs are the, are the highest. Fully agree with you on that. Sounds good. I'm not sure on the status of uh, North Coast Home Builders right now. I think that they've just been kind of put on the shelf because there's no real issues for them to, you know, challenge or anything. So I, um, I I'll do some checking on that to see. I, I know I was on the board for that before I got on the planning commission. So I know most of the members and, and uh, 
I'll do a little checking on that myself. But uh, all those names that came up would be key people to to reach out to. Um, um, all of them are in the in the business. I can just throw out one other idea. <clears throat> And I certainly don't want it to be controversial, so I just wanted to see if if this makes sense to you guys as it does to me. But um, somebody who I've gotten a lot of really interesting ideas from in this vein, and who, funnily enough, is is often on the side of giving more leeway and freedom to developers to be creative, is Colin Fisk of the uh, Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. Um, I, you know, I don't want to dilute the focus of this, but since we are talking about, you know, how to streamline, incentivize, and make more affordable, you know, development in these sort of infill urbanized areas, um, he's someone who's who's given a lot of thought to that, and there could be some ways in which there are there are changes we could make that both achieve the goal of making affordable housing more affordable or de development in general more affordable while also taking better account of some of the goals we have for um, frankly non-carbonized transportation and things like that you know bike lanes pedestrian paths so it's just a thought if if that's objectionable to other commissioners it's I'm happy to withdraw the suggestion no it, it Noah it, it sounds through the chair um, that sounds reasonable so that there's input there from um, everybody uh, to a certain degree and not just developers so that we don't get a big pushback on anything that may come to us. I, I, I think that's kind of my thought too, because it's, this is an issue he'll be very interested in, has ideas about, has, you know, in a few cases, um, like in the housing element, he's brought up some of those ideas before the commission. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, if I, I appreciate what you're saying, I think that's, that's the idea is to show that it was trying to get a couple of different angles on the problem. Okay, any other comments on this item? Uh, Melanie, I see your hand up. Is that still up from before or is that? Oh, yeah, that's from before. If Sorry. you bring it in, to, in for you, Noah, you have to bring in for all of us. I saw Sorry. that. You've got a plate of food. <laughs> Sorry. <All right. laughs> I didn't know that was coming in. Um, I'll, I'll turn on my shared smell button. Where's that button? There you go. <laughs> right on. Just a kid. All right. Uh, so, Melanie, you didn't have any more, any other questions? No, I didn't. Thank you. Um, well, with that, I think we'll we'll leave it to the director and Mr. Bronco to come up with some ideas and times, and we'll we'll bring this back at some future date. I don't know how quick it'll happen, but let's stay on it because we definitely need the housing. Um, with that, is there any other items, director? That any? No? I have nothing else to add tonight. No. Any comments or other things to be brought up by the commission? So with that, the next item is adjournment. Not bad, 744. So um, I guess we won't have a motion because nobody seemed to like that for adjournment. We'll just call this meeting adjourned and call a night. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. See everybody. Good night. Good, Good night. night.